The pastor's heart and Dominic Steele and thanks for joining us a special extra edition today and we're talking about the increasing unrest and impatience that I'm detecting among church leaders surrounding the decisions of our politicians and clear cases of well is it religious discrimination is it a lack of understanding of what happens in faith communities or just taking us for granted taking us for a ride there's been an important court ruling in Washington DC in relation to Mark Devers Capitol Hill Baptist Church they have won a legal challenge against the authorities there but the unsettlement unrest over here in Australia well church leader David Sheath has expressed it well on the situation in New South Wales he's written up until now I've been happily abiding by the wisdom of our political leaders as we respond to coronavirus but the situation at the moment feels unfair churches are limited to hundred and yet weddings can have hundred and fifty corporate events 300 and stadiums many thousands. Last week we wrote to our Premier, this week we received a reply but no action. The current limits make the logistics of church services really complex for our faithful volunteers and uncertain for people attending. He's right. A number of us were flabbergasted that the New South Wales Government would make such a blatantly discriminatory decision against people of faith when they increased the capacity from 100 to 300 for commercial activities, but left worship services at 100. Our guests today on The Pastor's Heart, Neil Foster, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Newcastle, and Ray Galea, Senior Pastor of MBM Rudy Hill in the west of Sydney. And we want to model today respectful disagreement. Ray, let's start with you and your pastor's heart. And uh, what's happening with your heart, with your people, and this frustration that we've got at the moment? It's... I mean, we, we are getting a little bit frustrated and it's the parity issue of looking across other areas and seeing, you know, when you see a theatre that can house a thousand people uh, and movies go for, a movie theatre goes for two hours and we're doing our best to keep social distancing, mask up, glove, um, um, no singing and you just think how are some getting exemptions and not others i don't think it's with malicious intent at all i'm so thankful for the government i've been thinking of doing a fantastic job i think we need to begin and end with saying that but there does seem to be an inconsistency in this area and as the weeks turn into months there is a growing frustration that we're we're forbidden from doing the very thing that's essential to the nature of what we are and that is believers who gather together and praise our great god and be encouraged by his word. So, yeah, there's a degree of frustration, I think. Hmm. Neil, uh, why don't you tell us what the story is about what's happened in Washington and Capitol Hill Baptist Church? Sure, Dominic. Uh, glad to do that. So uh, Capitol Hill Baptist Church is um, a large Baptist church in Washington, D.C. It's been, uh, the court says it's been meeting for well over 100 years. Um, they have, uh, their pastor Mark Deaver is someone well known to many people in Sydney Anglican circles. He's written a number of really helpful books about uh, church churches. Um, there's one slightly unusual thing about Capitol Hill's theology, which is that they teach that the whole congregation ought to meet together at the same time every week. So many of us would be happy to have two or three different meetings on a Sunday, larger churches, and regard that as the church getting together. Um, but one particular feature of the theology of, of uh, Capitol Hill is that they say, no, no, we want everybody to get together on the same occasion. And so they've... Uh, I mean, and, and that's that's been a long-standing position of Capitol Hill Baptist Church. I remember, I remember visiting Mark in the year 2000 and him telling me that that was their position way back then, but it goes back much further than then. Well, I'm not sure, I'm sure it may, um, but uh, it's, I just, I just say that not to say they're right or wrong, but just to say that's a specific thing that is really important in this decision. Um, and so Washington DC, the District of Columbia has set down its COVID rules, which of course vary all over the United States from different jurisdictions. And their COVID rules at the moment say that places of worship uh, have to be restricted to, uh, I think, the four square metre rule or 100 people at maximum. 
and and that's whether they meet inside or outside. So it's very explicit. Um, uh, worship services um, have a maximum of 100. Now, this, of course, has made it impossible for Capitol Hill to keep on doing what they think they ought to do in their building. And my understanding is that they actually have moved their whole meeting over, over the state line to Virginia, where the rules are different, and they've been meeting in Virginia. But they still would like to meet in their building in um, DC. And so they uh, took an action against the, uh, after a lot, of, a lot of time, a lot of negotiation, a lot of discussion, attempt to resolve it outside the court system. They then took a legal action um, against the District of Columbia uh, and they based it on what's called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Now, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is a piece of legislation that was enacted by the US Federal Congress back in 1993. Uh, and what it does is it says that uh, the government cannot substantially burden free exercise of religion unless it can show that it's got a compelling reason and that it's enacted rules that are the least restrictive rules for that purpose. And um, basically, to cut a long story short, uh, the church was able to persuade the uh, district court judge here uh, that uh, there was a substantial burden on their religious exercise because they are convinced that they must meet as a group uh, together on a Sunday, um, that the government could not demonstrate compelling reasons. And one of the reasons the government couldn't demonstrate the compelling justification was its inconsistent application of these rules to other large gatherings. So the, the judge refers to the fact, for example, that uh, a number of political protests were supported by the mayor of the District of Columbia. Um, and so people were having large political protests without distancing or masks. Uh, they have also opened up uh, restaurants and said that restaurants, if they have people eating outdoors, have no limits on numbers. So people can eat outdoors in restaurants, all sorts of other contexts where there can be large numbers. Um, but there was no way the district could offer a particular scientific justification for this rule being imposed on churches um, when it's not applied consistently to other contexts. So the court said there was no compelling justification and certainly the rules were not the least restrictive that could have been imposed. And as a result, the court issued an injunction against the enforcement of this rule. And my understanding is that uh, Capitol Hill Baptist has said that uh, as soon as they can find a sufficiently large outdoor venue in DC, they will be getting back together as a whole group of about a thousand in an outdoor venue somewhere in District of Columbia. And they've said they're going to socially distance households, they're going to have masks, but they just feel they need to meet together. Mm -hmm. So Ray, you pastor a church of roughly the same size uh, in Sydney. Um, I haven't heard you talk about um, getting a field outside, <laughs> but you've got the same frustration with the government. Listen, it's a bit more attractive now that summer's coming, but uh, the thought of doing it outside in winter, I don't know how they're thinking outside. But I, they are a model, by the way, in how you handle this matter because they're going through the proper channels and I really, it's got integrity written all over it. Um, how are we going? I mean, it's just, uh, you, you know, we've got three services on our Rudy Hill site. We normally would have 25, ch uh, we would normally have 120 children, up to 120, ch 25 children at each service. We can only have 20, 25. You know, when they go out, we're left with 65 in a, in a hall that seats 450. It's, you know, you've got the team relationship with the kids. The kids can't meet each week. The leaders can't meet with the kids each week. We want the kids to develop good relationship with their leaders. It's just eroding our fellowship uh, relationships, and uh, it, 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 you know, for a for a season it's okay, but uh, the season gets too long, and it has very long term detrimental effects. So, what would you like to see happen? Uh, look, I'd love it to move from one hundred to three hundred. Um, I think that's comparable. You've got uh, corporate events that can meet at a size of 300. Um, what are the other you, pubs and clubs can meet at 300? So it seems to me that at a basic, you know, comparative level, that would be a reasonable. We're not asking for more than others are having, but we're not really asking for less either. And that's uh, and and the thing is, 
it seems like we're, you know, at a restaurant. I mean, we had a lady the other day say she couldn't understand how she could go to church, uh, go to a restaurant with her church friends, face to face, crammed in in a place with other people, less than, you know, the social distancing even between the tables, the cleaning that wasn't happening from, from you know, guests moving in and out, uh, the, the no masks, uh, and you think that's allowed and we work to such a stringent formula, which is okay, um, but but limiting it to 100 seems to be, you know, that extra straw that's breaking the camel's back. So 300, please, please Gladys, give us 300. <laughs> Why do you think they haven't? I can't judge motives. I don't know. I think we're, you know, in the big scheme of things, we're not, you know, we we, we don't have the we don't have the money backing of a corporate uh, or a sporting event. So I think it's easier for us to be presumed upon, not maliciously, but I think, and you know, there has been some, you know, conduct some churches that haven't conducted themselves above reproach. Um, I think we're more likely to be the silent minority and <laughs> you can sort of presume on that a little bit. I hate judging motives though. It's not for me to know. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, re I'm almost hesitant to answer that question, Dominic. But uh, there, there's certainly some possible reasons, but I don't know. Mm. What are your thoughts, Neil, there? I, I really echo what Ray has said. He and I go back a long way, and we've always thought the same way. <laughs> well, we're, we're the first. We were in the same year at Moore College, and can I say, one of us got first class honours, and I can't remember which one. Neil, can you remind no, me? No, was it you or was it me? <laughs> oh, I must have been you. That's right. Just clearing up. Sorry, Neil. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, the motives are unclear. Um, sadly, if you step back. The sorts of meetings that have been allowed larger numbers are the commercial ventures where one can imagine either some of the people involved have put some sort of pressure on the government from the commercial side of things or just the government thinks this would contribute to the economy whereas getting churches together won't you know contribute to the economy which would be a sad rationale i think the fact is people who go to church um, are people who uh, care about each other, care about their community. Um, I think there's a fair bit of evidence that actually attending church has good benefits for people's mental health and coping. And so you would actually think in this time of difficulty that allowing people to join together with a church family uh, would actually be positive and long-term beneficial if you have to concentrate on economic factors for the economy uh, in terms of people's mental health and stability and all those sorts of things. So, But unfortunately, there's a bit of a short-term um, analysis going on. And I think, too, it's possible that some of the people making decisions just don't know what churches do. I mean... I look at I look at the COVID um, rules, for example, for churches, and it says no chanting. And I'm going, how many churches <laughs> are engaged in chanting these days? Well, okay, there are probably some, but it's a fairly small percentage, I would have thought. So yes. I think the, the knowledge of what goes on in churches is a bit lacking sometimes as well. Look, we know generally, sorry, Dominic, the, the financial bottom line tends to over always outrank the social bottom line uh, and the social good bottom line. It's just human nature. Mm -hmm. And so they're already balancing health and economy anyway, uh, and they're trying to do that well. I, I think they are doing that well and trying to factor both in. We're just a third wheel in the, you know, third cog in the wheel. And um, uh, and it's you're right, it's much more long-term in terms of consequential. Now, I've been given a copy of the Archbishop of Sydney's letter to the Premier, where he says where the capacity of church buildings allows a number greater than 100 people, it seems unfair and unjustified to restrict the numbers at public places of worship in the present circumstances. And, uh, I mean, that was the letter he sent to the Premier, and then it was absurd to see the government's pathetic reply that on Saturday the Minister for Health issued a general exemption for four places of worship to allow as many as 300 attendees subject to the four square metre rule. 
the four places being the Jewish Great Synagogue, the Islamic Gallipoli Mosque, the Catholic St. Mary's Cathedral, and the Anglican St. Andrew's Cathedral. And it just seemed to me to be an inept olive branch to try and yeah. shut up people of faith. Is that yeah. how you reacted? <laughs> yeah, well, that feels very token. Um, and it assumes that they're, they're the larger assemblies. Um, hmm. it, it's ignored other denominations. I mean, it's problematic from lots of levels, isn't it? Hmm. Um, and, and just arbitrary and token. Um, so yeah. I just think they really, it does, you know, and the Archbishop wrote it well, it feels unfair. So it, it, it's, you know, he's describing the perception of the, of the decision and the response to that letter almost reinforces the fact that it's moving from feeling unfair to becoming unfair. Um, yeah. So what would you recommend, Neil Foster? Well, um, I wrote a, a blog piece about this the other day, and uh, as I pointed out there, um, there's very little scope for legal action, as was taken by Mark Deaver's church, even you know, if, if we thought that there was justification for it in general terms, because we don't have um, strong protection for religious freedom uh, in Australia. We don't have anything equivalent to the Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act that they were able to use, or indeed, there's no real strength to our um, Section 116. I think the appropriate approach at the moment is for church-going members of the public to let the government know that they are finding this unacceptable and encourage them in the interests of fairness and the interests of the long-term benefit of people in the community to open up church gatherings again. Um, and so I would be encouraging people to write to, uh, for example, the Premier. In my blog post the other day, I put in a link to a page on the internet where you can go and provide comments to the Premier um, and to your local member if you think your local member will be helpful. I mean, we are very blessed in Australia with a robust democracy where people are allowed to express these views and put them forward. And uh, I'd be encouraging people to uh, to do that and to let the government know that uh, they're feeling that this is really an unfair situation. And that's exactly what I did. I read um, Neil's blog and right at the end there was a little link, pressed it and was able to uh, communicate my thankfulness as well as my concerns and my plea to increase the number to 300. What happens if we don't get a response, Neil? How, how, what's the next thing that churches can do? Is there a next thing? Well... <laughs> I mean, the, do you advocate we, civil disobedience here? Well, OK, I knew you were going to ask me about that, Dominic. So... Um, my view is that uh, things have to get pretty bad before Christians are unjustified in engaging in civil disobedience. Um, and I'm not quite sure they're that bad yet. It's frustrating. It's annoying. Um, we aren't being completely precluded, though, most of us, from uh, doing things that we regard as religious duties. Now, I, for example, it would be difficult or different if for those people, for example, who felt that a religious ceremony such as mass or something like that had to happen every week, you know, in a big group or something like that, that, that I think would be quite hard. Um, most of churches in Australia, I think most of the Christians in Australia regard these current restrictions as, uh, as annoying and unfair, but they aren't requiring us to disobey God. That's what most of us think, would think. Now, again, Capitol Hill Baptist is a bit different. They took the view that it was actually a religious obligation for the whole congregation to meet in the one place every week. If you took that view, um, then I guess the model of Capitol Hill is a good model. You try your very best to do what you can to keep the meeting. And as I say, they went to the extent of crossing the border. People who didn't live in Virginia, they tried to get them to go over there to have their meetings. Um, it's harder in Australia <laughs> and crossing borders is <laughs> sometimes not even an option here. Uh, you know, uh, our Victorian friends can't really <laughs> drive north to New South Wales for a church service, um, or very few of them can. 
So I think um, we are at the point uh, where people are frustrated, but I think we keep on pressing ahead. There, one can conceivably see a point where the go if the government said Christians just cannot meet, uh, or for example, Christians can't teach certain Bible passages in their meetings or something like that, where civil disobedience under the principles in Acts chapter four, where we must obey God rather than men, where that might come into play. But I very much tend to uh, start with Romans 13, which tells us that we should be normally grateful to God for the provision of the government. And it's a matter of conscience for Christians to obey the law, uh, so long as we can do so without directly disobeying God. Um, that seems to me uh, the approach at the moment. So my own view is that we've got a bit of a way to go in Australia before we need to approach that, that point. Uh, because Capitol Hill, you're right, the one congregation model, and they, that's from the very beginning. That's a deep conviction of Mark Dever. And for them, they're violating Hebrews 10.25 about not forsaking many with one another as some are in the habit. And, and so it cuts at the very core uh, in a way that I don't think for the rest of East Evangelicals, when our consciences aren't as bound by that, mindful that we're in a temporary season, and we're able to fellowship, though not as often as we would like. It's it's we're in that season, but I tell you what, you know, if we're here a year from now, mm. we might be thinking something very mm. differently. Mm. And I mean, we're going to have a conversation tomorrow on the Pastor's Heart about planning for Christmas, and uh, yeah. it, there's a whole different way of thinking about Christmas depending on uh, which way we go, on whether or not we can have 300 people or less than that in terms of Christmas events. But we've got to keep putting a stone in the shoe here. And I think when, because we're such strong, we have such a strong convictions because of Romans 13 and, and other places about submitting to governing authorities, you know, it's kind of, especially us Anglicans, you know, uh, it's such a high value for us that to, um, to kind of in any way protest almost feels unbiblical, like you're disrespecting, but we just got to learn that Paul model for us. If there are opportunities through the legal system to maximize the opportunities for the gospel or um, mm. protection of rights, then engage in it, especially for the sake of the gospel. Mm. Um, and so he was not afraid to appeal uh, to his citizenship. Uh, and so speaking up, I, I feel like there's a hesitancy whether it's on this issue or even other issues, to actually have a voice politically and 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 not be tentative. And th there are sort of safe ways of doing it, like the suggestion that responding to um, that link that takes you straight to the Premier, to uh, speaking to your local member, agitate is actually not an unbiblical model, as long as it's done with respect and thankfulness, because it's a vehicle that's given to us in the Western world with the Westminster system in a way it wasn't given to Romans uh, Christians in the Roman world. Mm. I, I, and speaking as you did a moment ago, Neil, of annoying and frustrating, I feel annoyed and frustrated that I'm not permitted to sing behind a mask. I, I'm totally okay with not singing without a mask on, but I feel like um, if somebody can scream out at a football crowd or a, in a stadium event from immediately the row behind somebody else and spittle going onto the person there versus me quietly singing behind a mask one and a half metres from the next person, um, it just doesn't seem like the risk has been properly balanced. Right? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's partly a question of... You know, it's a scientific question, isn't it? Uh, I just don't know how the droplets go through the mask, uh, you know, to a greater or lesser extent uh, as without a mask. But at a superficial level, uh, when I when I look at the Rabbitohs supporters last weekend and uh, and aren't we all rejoicing that Roosters aren't, no, uh, aren't in the grand final, but, uh, but just seeing their passion and, uh, man, those droplets were going far and wide and knowing that, that I can't sing behind a mask, which has got to restrict the droplets. Uh, it's a mystery to me. I, but I do think we need medical. That's that. That's a. We need to move it into the objective world. We need some empirical data, and uh, and make a basis on that. Uh, otherwise, we've got you know three you know, theologically biased people who are just trying to make a conclusion. But certainly at a superficial level, it it does not seem to line up. Yeah. Well, we'll chase up an epidemiologist on that. Uh, but Neil, did you have a comment? Oh, again, I think that's right. 
your gut feeling is it surely must be reasonably safe. But um, yeah, like to see what the research is on this. Um, it's interesting. I, some of the research in this area gets done by people who are desperate for choirs to restart, you know, official church music choirs and all that sort of stuff. Um, and for them, I imagine singing behind a mask would just be um, aesthetically <laughs> unacceptable. But for your ordinary pew sitting, as it were, chair sitting congregation member, um, singing behind a mask would be better than not singing. Um, and we have uh, kind of watch parties at our church where a number of us all socially distanced and wearing masks and everything sit around and watching um, a, t a TV broadcast of our church service. And it's very hard sometimes not to sing when you're used to singing and they have some music. So uh, it would be lovely, Dominic, if you could find someone who would have an expert opinion on that matter. And also then, of course, if that expert opinion could get through to the um, decision makers in the health department. Neil Foster, Ray Galea, thanks very much for talking to us this afternoon. Pleasure. Thank My you. guest on The Pastor's Heart, uh, Neil Foster, the Associate Professor of Law at the University of Newcastle, and Ray Galea, the Senior Pastor of MBM Rudy Hill in the west of Sydney. And just a reminder, tomorrow on The Pastor's Heart, we're going to be talking planning for Christmas in this COVID season. And Pete Stedman and Stu Crawshaw will be here to talk to me about that. Thanks for your company. We'll look forward to talking to you tomorrow.